All right, so welcome everyone. This is our time for genetics family conversation. We are in month four of this topic area. Our topic area this month or this 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 session is Ehlers Danlos syndrome. And today I am so um, blessed to have uh, some families with us today who are going to share their story. We have um, a couple uh, logistical things we'll take care of and then I will introduce them to you. First, we have our HRSA funding statement. Thank you. We want to thank our funders always for their support to be able to do this work. And um, we want to thank HRSA for that, for that support. Um, most of you know me, but if not, I'm Christy Lees. I'm the projects manager for Mountain States Regional Genetics Network, and I'm the point person for the Time for Genetics initiative. I have some exciting news to share with uh, you all as cohort number one. Um, we have added cohort number two, which will be, who will be joining us in April. Um, we have accepted 11 new clinics into the program to join you all, and we are really excited about um, growing, growing this program. So you can see the map there. Um, cohort number one is, is designated in yellow, and cohort number two is designated in orange. Um, again, as I always say uh, during every call, if you know someone who may be interested in participating in Time for Genetics, please have them fill out the application at uh, the page below. We will be uh, opening up cohort number three applications um, this summer, but the application is up now. So if they do have any interest, please have them go ahead and fill that out and we can reach out to them to let them know the timing of our, of our next cohort um, number three. With that, I uh, want to introduce you to some amazing families that have um, been so supportive of the work that Mountain States has done. And also, um, since uh, you all had your mailer month last month, where you actually got um, some mail from Mountain States, and you received the uh, EDS algorithm in print, um, these families were involved in um, the family perspective of making of that EDS algorithm. So they have done a lot of work around this because of their personal experience. So with that, I'm going to introduce to you Daphne Fulton and Katie Dulliver from Texas and Michaela Allison King from Colorado. And what we're going to do is we're going to let um, Daphne and Katie tell their stories um, and then um, let Michaela tell her story. We'll open it up for any question and answer. I have a couple questions um, that I'd like to ask them as well. And so we'll, we'll take it from there. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so you can see Daphne and Katie there full screen. And I'll go ahead and let Daphne and, and Katie take over. Do you wanna go first, mom? Or do you want me to? I'll let you start. Okay. Um, so our story is my son, Ryan, who is now seven. He was diagnosed with vascular Ehlers-Danlos. Um, we got the official diagnosis the day before he turned two years old. Um, and how it started was we actually had no idea. We knew something was wrong. Um, but when he was, the pregnancy was typically normal. I had a few issues, but outside of that, it was just a kidney infection. I did have um, contractions early, starting at around 28 weeks, but I have a very active job. I'm always on my feet. So they just thought I was being just too active. Um, my water did break at 31 and a half weeks. Um, he was born on a big side. He was born at six pounds, nine ounces at 31 and a half weeks. Um, the NICU doctor actually didn't think anything was, he didn't think he was premature because of his size. So he really didn't get a full workup. Um, he was born with a club foot, but that didn't really alarm us at all. Neither did the preterm labor. My niece, my youngest niece was born with a club foot. My husband has a uncle, a distant uncle that was born with a club foot. So we know it runs in the family. So again, no big, no big deal for us. We didn't really think anything of it. Um, and around six months old, we started noticing he was getting bruises across his forehead, on his shins, brought it up to his pediatrician, his pediatrician was like, oh, it's bruises. It's probably from his club feet shoes because they have the bar between it. And he 
and looking at his baby pictures, he liked to sleep with his feet up, up at his head. Kid you not, he would be in his bouncer, his feet would literally like be at his head, just uncomfortable looking at it. Uh, <laughs> so we just kind of kept an eye on it. And around about a year old, we, my mom and I took him to, we just went shopping. We were, he was in an umbrella stroller for maybe, maybe 20 minutes. And when I got him in the bath later that night on his spine was black and blue, like bruises up across and down his spine. So, um, his pediatrician is actually really good about, you know, letting us send pictures and messages. So I uploaded pictures of this and remind you, it's a Saturday night after hours. I knew I probably wouldn't get a response back until like Monday or Tuesday. Um, I got a response an hour later, uh, saying to meet him at his office Monday morning to not even call for an appointment. He'll fit us right in. So as he was really examining Ryan, just within the 10, 15 minutes of being in the exam room, he saw new bruises popping up. So he wanted to run a bunch of blood work, which he came in when he told me what it was. He was like, you need to brace yourself because this is very similar to how leukemia manifests in kids. And so at that point, I was like, okay, I kind of already knew. I did some Googling, which I shouldn't do. Um, so we just sit around and wait. All the blood work came back the next day. It was negative. He told us to come back that he had a few more tests he needed to run. Those came back negative. And so at the end of that week, he told us he was going to send us to Texas Children's in Houston um, to see a hematologist because he admitted he didn't know what was going on. He knew something was wrong with um, my son. He just didn't know what it was. And so he's like, let's start here we'll see what they say. And then we'll follow, we'll follow up. And the hematologist decided to run. We had to go see her every week for about six weeks. They took an average of six to 10 tubes of blood from him every week. Um, they ran the, the leukemia test every week because they thought maybe it just wasn't positive yet that he showed all the signs and symptoms of leukemia. They told us not to give him ibuprofen or Advil. They told us to make sure he doesn't, they told us a bunch of stuff over and over again. The hematologist, it was kind of like, yeah, you told us this last week. Yes, you told us this last week. Um, she did notice that his skin was very thin, like you could see through it. So she wanted to send us to a dermatologist while we're still waiting. She was kind of dumbfounded that all of the tests came back negative. So she did send us to a genetics counselor because she was kind of at a loss. The dermatologist took pictures, said, I think it could be this, this, and this. And we're like, okay. Um, about four days later, the genetic, the dermatologist called me up and she said, Hey, I want to apologize, but I took your son's case to a round table. And I was like, you don't need to apologize. It's fine. She goes, well, I didn't ask for your permission. I was like, it's fine. The more people who have eyes on this, the better. And she goes, we came to the conclusion that it could be vascular Ehlers-Danlos. And there was two more. I don't even remember what those other two are now. Um, so she's like, we're pretty sure that it's vascular Ehlers-Danlos, but it possibly could be these other two. So she partnered with who we did the genetics testing through, which was Baylor. And she wanted them to run that test, those three tests first. And she did tell us that it will take anywhere from 12 weeks to up to 20 weeks to get any results back and to just wait. <laughs> um, and sure enough, we got the call the day before he turned to that it was positive for vascular Ehlers Delos. And that's when our life changed. Mom, do you have anything to add? When he was born, you could see through his skin. And when I would hold him up as a baby, I knew something was wrong with him. In fact, I told him several times, this baby's sick, there's something wrong. And it got to the point where my son-in-law told me not to say that anymore, that I wouldn't be able to, to hold the baby if I said that anymore. 
but I knew something was wrong because looking at his eyes was a dead giveaway. Those are not the normal eyes of a baby. Very deep, sunken, dark eyes, like a sick child. And then I started looking at other facial features. And all I could think of was this is, this is not normal. There's something going on here. The moment Katie, they got the diagnosis, Katie called me. I'm a university professor. I'm a health professor. So the first thing I did, I was sitting at my desk at the university. And the first thing I did was get into the literature. Okay, what's in the literature about vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome? Five articles that did not tell me very much. Only five. Some of them were just kind of like, huh? And so I knew they needed information. There was absolutely none out there. So the next thing I did was I went to the NIH website. Big mistake. I knew they were 10 years behind putting anything up. And I knew it would be the worst case scenario, but I didn't have any other alternatives. Um, Fineseaver.com was not there yet, but um, I really didn't have any alternatives. So I went to those websites, was thoroughly uh, mortified because there was nothing out there, no research, nothing out there to help my kids through this process. And for Katie, she knew something was wrong because while they were in the process of going through all the genetic testings, I went to every doctor's appointment there was. I even took him to get blood drawn when she had to work. And uh, her husband had kind of denied it. Oh, he's just a boy the entire time. Well, it became real for him with the diagnosis. But for Katie, pre-diagnosis, she knew something was wrong. She asked me, mom, do you really think there's something wrong with him? And so then I gave her the standard answer I give to all people who are important to me and do you want me to tell you the truth or do you want me to tell you what you want to hear and she said I want the truth and all I could say was yes I don't know what it is it's genetic there's something going on and now I'll let her finish um there's a little research that when we met with the geneticist that the hematologist recommended he was like oh you were diagnosed with vascular Ehlers-Danlos and handed us a paper and goes, here you go. And it was literally a printout of what WebMD says. <laughs> and then he goes, well, you need to see a vascular doc. And I believe there's one here at Texas Children's who sees patients with this. And that was it. That's all he said. So it was pretty much, here's a pamphlet of what you probably already know. And here's the next doctor to go to. Um, yeah. He didn't tell us his name, what to do if we had an event before then, because everything we'd read, NIH said that he could die while we're holding him in our arms. So, yeah, it was bad. What not to do? Yeah. Luckily, with the new patient, with his diagnosis, the vascular doc got us in pretty quick at that time, which was, you know, five years ago, going on six years ago. At that time, she only had seven patients. With vascular EDS, now she's up to 19 patients um, with vascular EDS. Um, I wish I could say it was because it was more common. It's just, it's now getting to where people are getting genetic testing more often. Um, and they're recognizing life events in young kids that shouldn't happen or it's unusual for them to happen. But the biggest struggle for us was no one really knew what to do. His vascular doc was, of course, she was the most well known. She was just like, no contact sports, um, no Advil, no ibuprofen. He can't do this. He can't do that. He can't do this. Um, but unfortunately, because of all the bruising and the fact that it took us a while to get a diagnosis, CPS was very involved in our lives. They tried to take him away twice. Um, and because no one really knew, it was kind of when you would take him to the ER, the ER docs would kind of give you the side eye of like, mm, are you sure you're not beating your kid? Um, I got into an argument with the nurse because of it, even though 
the doctor was on my side, the nurse didn't believe me and the nurse didn't believe the doctor. So there's a lot of, there's just not enough education out there in regards to vascular EDS. We're always having to play the doctor when we take our kid in anywhere. Um, just like he ruptured his eardrum this past summer and had to have surgery. And the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, and two other docs decided to come up with an experimental surgery to keep to minimize the risk of bleeding during his surgery. And sure enough, it actually worked. But they too were also like, well, tell me about this. Um, the anesthesiologist probably pushed back the surgery an hour and a half just so he could get information from my husband and I and soak it up where versus before when he would get tubes, the anesthesiologist was like, oh, he's fine. It's just, you know, hypermobility. And they kept tying, you know, vascular EDS with hypermobility. And it's like, no, 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 no. Ours has to do with the vascular system, not the joints. And so that's another thing is a lot of people tie us into hypermobility. And yes, there are several characteristics between the two, but they're completely different and you approach them completely different. And that's too has been a struggle because most doctors are like, oh yeah, I know what it is. And then they really don't, or they'll totally ignore, ignore us because we don't have MD next to us. And so we have to play parent advocate and MD a lot of the times when we take them in places. It gets really good. Um because you know that there's a problem, but when you access emergency services, they don't see it as a problem because we were told he has a bump on the head, he needs a scan. That's what his vascular doc said. So he gets a big goose egg and a cut where he's gonna have to have sutures because his skin is half the thickness of yours. So you scratch, he tears. So we take him in and we'll say, we were at, we were actually in San Marcos together at a family gathering and he fell and cut his head and we had to take him to the ER there. And the, we had all of his stack of medical records, kid you not, two inches thick about the diagnosis and everything and took them with us. And they said, oh, well, you know, we know what hypermobility, uh, what EDS is. It's got stretchy skin and loose joints. And we're kind of like, no, that's not vascular EDS is totally different. Didn't even call us back for about, I don't know, we didn't see the triage nurse for at least 30 minutes. And by this time, triage nurse really was unprofessional in certain ways because he kept saying, I don't know what this is. I don't know what this is. And it was kind of like, we're trying to tell you what this is. And here's the information you need. So he didn't even get called back until we called my brother-in-law, who's an invasive cardiologist on staff at that hospital. And he called him and poof, we got sent right on back because he said, there's a problem with this kid. He needs help. And then we saw a nurse practitioner who was savvy enough to say, I don't know what this is. And we said, well, here, we've got his vascular doc cell phone number. And she said to call her here, call her. And and he did. Probably one of the most refreshing things for us, though, besides medical care and doctors not understanding what it, what it is, is that there is no treatment and there is no cure and there's very little research, very little. And it's a lot more, according to Dr. Peter Byers, who's probably the most prominent geneticist that works on this, it's probably a lot more prevalent than people know that you hear about kids dying on a ball field, the well, majority of them probably have some type of vascular EDS. Uh, so it's probably a lot more prevalent and nobody knows they have it. We've got people walking around and they just have a dissection and die. Whereas if they knew what they were living with, they may be able to take some precautions. But for Katie and Kyle, I mean, it's even changed the way they've taken vacations. You know, they can't take a kid like him to Disney. He's not going to be able to ride a lot of those rides. They can't do a lot of things like that. They're not going to, her husband is a big hunter. I mean, really big into that outdoors person. He can't, he can't shoot a gun. The kick would, would literally kill him. 
it would tear him apart. So uh, it's really frustrating. And about 50% of the kids who have this, by the time they're in fifth grade, they're homeschooled because bullying is so bad. So it, it's a real problem when your friends are afraid to, to have him over to play because they're afraid something will happen, they won't handle it. You can't leave him with just a, a babysitter that you can leave with normal kids. It's, 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 it's a real problem and it's very frustrating and it's heartbreaking. Yeah, we, we were told by our vascular doc to, if we stay in Texas, learn where all the level one trauma centers are. Um, pediatric trauma one, if possible, but if not, we need to know where the nearest level one trauma center is in case of a life event, because that's who is going to have the doctors on staff that will be, um, that can at least comprehend what is wrong with him. So anytime we go anywhere, we have to know exactly where the nearest children's hospital is, where the nearest level one trauma center is. And then of course, we always have to have let our vascular doc know ahead of time, like, hey, we're gonna be traveling in this area, just FYI. Um, she's pretty good at text messaging. So we'll always text her and be like, hey, we have a trip coming up, just FYI. Um, Cause now his pediatrician in College Station is actually part, was acquired by Texas Children's. So anything that happens here in College Station, Houston, um, she knows right away what's going on and vice versa. But yeah, we have to know exactly where everything, where all the trauma centers are. Um, and we have to know the fastest way there because it, I mean, it can turn deadly real quick for kids like Ryan. And one of the things that we appreciated, and I appreciated about our pediatrician so much, was that when he found out what it was, he told my kids, he said, I don't know what this is, but within the next two weeks, I will have read everything written on it. Well, of course, at that time, there was only five things written on it. So he didn't have a lot to read, but at least he's willing, and he was willing to call the vascular doc, and he was willing to do that. And the fact that he was willing to go ahead and refer out testing instead of waiting like a lot of docs did saved a lot of time and a lot of heartbreak and wondering. So we really appreciated the early referrals. It really did help. And he's also one anytime I'm in his office, because now I have four kids. Um, so anytime I'm in his office with any of my kids, if he has a medical student with him or a resident or a fellow um, or even a nursing student, he will say, hey, so let me tell you about one of their kids. And he'll go into the whole story about Ryan um, they get double brownie points for when Ryan is there because he'll actually like walk everybody. He'll walk all the medical students, even if they're with a different position. Um, we can do, they'll, he'll show the bruises of Ryan so that way they can see. Thank you. Thank you all so much for sharing. I know what are very, very traumatic things to reshare and, and um, frustrating things. And um, can you just give us just in a, in a minute or so, just how Ryan's doing now? Um, it sounds like he's a- uh, he's, a he's, he's in first grade. Um, he still struggled. He can't do PE. So he does have a teacher's assistant to help him during PE and um, during recess. So he can't do the typical kids Luckily, he's at a school um, where the kids kind of think it's cool that you get to play games with the teacher. So they kind of think it's good that he gets to set out a PE. <laughs> um, but recess, it's a struggle for him. He doesn't get invited to birthday parties, um, which is sad because his sister does. Um, but I mean, he's a bright little boy. He's already on a third grade level for math. So, I mean... Without, if you look at him and you take away the bruises and the genetic features of his face, you wouldn't think anything was wrong with him because he's a typical, very sweet boy. 
Thank you so much for sharing your story. And thank you for the, the grandma mom perspective, because I think it's I think it's important. I think um, I know it was brought up in our genetics um, some about the, the grandmother effect, right? The, the grandmas pick up on some things um, because they've, they've been there, done that. So thank you for sharing that unique perspective. Um, so hang on tight. We'll probably have some questions for you, but let's switch over to Michaela and um, let Michaela tell her story of a different type of EDS, which I know she's going to go into, but I think it's a perfect um, comparison contrast because as you said, um, Daphne and Katie, um, it's often confused with vascular EDS. And so since we have that, that umbrella with all those different types, um, Michaela is going to highlight a different type for us um, with her journey. So go ahead, Michaela. Great. Um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing Ryan's story. And there were certain moments in there where you definitely pulled on my heartstrings too as a mama and especially some of those visits to the ED and, you know, things that, that go on when you have a medically complex kiddo. Um, I went into labor for the first time with Lily when I was 16 weeks pregnant and um, I was put on bed rest um, at that time, um, part-time bed rest. And then when I was 20 weeks pregnant, um, there was a tear in my amniotic sac for her at the top and amniotic fluid was coming out. And we actually had to revert, refuse hospital care in the ER because they were going to be treating me and not treating her. And I wasn't okay with that. So I left and my OB was incredible. And she saw me outpatient until I was 24 weeks along so that if something needed to be done, they could um, treat both of us in the hospital. Um, 27 ultrasounds every Friday to make sure there was enough fluid to keep her in there or if they needed to take her out. And I was on a drug called nifedipine every four hours and on bed rest for five months. Went into labor a total of, I think, six or seven times, multiple times stopping my labor with tributylene, mag sulfate, giving her steroids for her lungs twice, telling me that she was going to come. Miraculously, that nifedipine worked and all those medicines worked and she stayed inside until I was 35 weeks pregnant. And on that morning, um, my OB said, we would like you to stop taking the nifedipine because we think we can take better care of her on the outside if your body and she's wanting to come. Then she came that, that afternoon. Uh, my water broke again and she came within just a couple hours at five pounds, um, three ounces. And at first, she actually was very healthy. She had a little trouble keeping her temperature, but we were only in the hospital for five days. And then when she was eight weeks um, old, she did develop RSV and pneumonia and was hospitalized for a few, a few weeks. Simultaneously, at the same time, I had a, um, a um, pelvic bleed and um, it was very significant. I was hospitalized for five days and had surgery and found out that I had placenta accreta. We didn't know that I had had that when I was pregnant. And then um, Lily healed um, from her RSV and pneumonia, went home in oxygen and was developing pretty typically until she was about six months old. I really started noticing she was missing her milestones, which was one of the first keys, I think, to diagnosis of you know, any sort of conditions like this. And her pediatrician just wasn't very concerned, um, said, you know, she's born a little bit early, let's just give her time. Um, and then when she was about 10 or 11 months old, that's when she first learned how to crawl. So things were, were significantly delayed in my mind. I was pregnant with friends and, you know, they, their babies were born right around the same time. And you know, I even had a friend whose baby was walking at eight months. Now, I know that's crazy, but she was walking at eight months. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, let's just kind of keep her eye here. And then when she was 14, 15 months old, I just knew something really wasn't right. Um, her hypotonia had become very apparent, although there was no diagnosis. I had no idea what that was. Um, but I can look back now and see that that had become very obvious. And so I was talking to my sister, you know, bringing in family and um, she said, um, you know, let's call Uncle Andrew's best friend, um, Dr. Abby. He's a pediatrician in Arvada. Let's just switch care and get another opinion on what's going on. 
So on that very first appointment with Dr. Abby, um, she was diagnosed with hypotonia, hip dysplasia, um, and gl gross um, global delays. So um, we started her in therapy at that time, physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, and she got a walker when she was 18 months old. She was able to walk with a walker. And then when she was 21, 22 months old, she was able to walk without her walker. And um, things seemed to be going really well. We were monitoring her hip dysplasia closely with Shriners Hospital and also Children's to see if she was going to have to have surgery. She's wearing braces for her ankles and her um, pelvis and also um, um, doing you know, all of her strengthening exercises. And then when she was about two, she woke up one morning and she couldn't walk and she couldn't talk. She army crawled herself out of her toddler bed and was at the top of the stairs. And I looked up at her and she was mouthing the words mama and I knew something was really wrong. So I called the doctor and they had me call um, an ambulance and they came and took her into children's and we were there for almost two weeks. Um, this was a time when all of a sudden she had all sorts of specialists. So she went from having, you know, her orthopedic doctor um, to now having a neurologist, a metabolicist, um, all sorts of different doctors trying to figure out what was going on with her little body. Um, she had spinal tap, an MRI, all sorts of tests. Um, they, she had already had a microarray to see, um, I think that's the name of it. Sorry, I'm not <laughs> a social worker, not a doctor. Um, I don't remember all the things. Um, Lily is 11 now, so it's hard sometimes to remember these, these details from a long time ago. But um, after, honestly, about a week, they still couldn't figure out what was going on. And her neurologist would come in and she would have a team of doctors with her. Um, she, um, Dr. Abigail Collins, absolutely amazing at children's. And it was like an episode of House. Every time she would come in, they would start going through all these potentials, um, things that could possibly be going on, looking at GLUT1, um, some significant um, metabolic conditions. And the only thing that came is that it showed that there was a difficulty in um, a low carnotaur level, which is um, an energy transport um, across our, our, our blood brain barrier and body barrier for muscular um, condition. And um, it was just low. It wasn't really, really low, but um, Dr. Dr. Collins said, you know, I had a kiddo one time that had this and I started him on prescription creatine and it was a huge difference. And I really think we should try this. And I was like, okay. So I kid you not, she started on that Carnotaur um, at that time, four times a day. And by the time she was out of the hospital, she was now able to walk up a flight of stairs. So she did not regress. She actually progressed after the metabolic crash. So now with this new um, prescription creatine, L-carnitor, it was nutritionally maximizing her muscles ability to function. And so she was able to walk up a flight of stairs. It was so obvious to PT, PCP, everybody's like, okay, this has got to really be a metabolic condition. This could not just, you know, flip, flip a switch just like that for this kiddo. So then we started seeing the metabolicist more regularly at the hospital, and he just wasn't convinced that this was having this big of an effect on her body. And so to flash forward some time period, there were episodes in and out of the hospital for years. There were seizure-like episodes. There were sleep studies. There were more MRIs. There were glute ones diagnosis parameters being expanded, so more spinal taps. There were all sorts of things. And we would go from doctor to doctor, not because I was saying we need to go doctor to doctor. We were literally being shared from specialist to specialist. We would have a neurologist call the endocrinologist and say, can you see this patient now? We've got to figure out what's going on. And with all of that care, it was a blessing, except every time something happened, every time she got hurt um, with a, like she, she would dislocate her pelvis, her SI would dislocate, things like this would happen, then all of a sudden there were all sorts of doctors coming in and um, you know comparing care. And it was wonderful, except when you have so many different opinions, it's sometimes as a parent, it's really hard to think like, well, which, you know, which thing should we focus on and which thing is the most important? And it wasn't until she was five that she learned how to skip. 
And as soon as she learned how to skip, she would skip to the mailbox and back. She was so excited. She loved skipping. And her little knees would swell up and get really swollen and painful. And her PCP said, let's run some arthritic um, tests. Let's see what's going on in there. And after doing so and realizing that none of that was positive um, for any of those tests, that's when her connected, or that's when her um, developmental pediatrician suggested that we make an appointment with a connective tissue geneticist. Now, mind you, at this time, she had also just completed exome sequencing. And the only hit that came back was a premature um, or a premutation for fragile X, which explained nothing. And little did we know that EDS HT doesn't have all of the genetic markers um, available for genetic testing. So that's when we waited seven months and we were then able to get in to see Dr. Gary Bellis at Children's, the geneticist who's no longer there, um, but was amazing and literally diagnosed her in less than 15 minutes and said, this is what's going on. Collagen dysfunctions can affect every area of the body in different ways. That's what's going on with her GI system. That's why she's constipated all of the time. That's why she has urinary leakage. That's why she experiences double vision. That's why there's all of these pieces because everything can be connected. And when this happened, when she received her diagnosis, the most interesting part as a parent is I go back to when we were going from specialist to specialist and we would go into an appointment and we'd sit down and they would say, oh, you've seen a lot of doctors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's seen a lot of doctors. And um, we would explain, you know, simple reasoning. We would like to make sure that this part of her body is okay, whether it's her vision or whatever she was dealing with at the time. When she was eight, um, she couldn't swallow for four days and had a feeding tube and biopsies and all sorts of things going on. And so, of course, you know, when all of those things can affect your whole body system, you're looking for an answer. And there were a few doctors that had said, really, what difference does a diagnosis make? And it was my job as her advocate to say, well, we have a muscle rehab doctor who's telling us that this could be something muscular that they haven't found the diagnosis for. And so when she gets tired, she should use her wheelchair. And then we have a PCP saying, maybe you should push her a little bit harder so her muscles can get stronger. And that's a very, very different um, way of looking at treatment. And once she was diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos, we were allowed to get everybody on the same page in that she's not going to hurt her muscles by strengthening them. What that's going to do is help compensate for those loose joints so that she's less likely to dislocate major joints like her pelvis. So for us, you know, the journey um, at some times was really difficult. There was a time when she was having her seizure-like episodes that the neurologist um, was encouraging um, an ambulance call every single time because the episodes were getting longer and they were always happening in the middle of the night. There were a lot of traumatic things that were building up when they weren't sure what was going on. Come to find out she had a magnesium deficiency, which is not uncommon in people with Ehlers-Danlos hypermobility type. And her seizure-like episodes stopped after starting magnesium on a daily basis before she goes to bed. So um, she didn't receive the diagnosis until she was six, but it literally changed her life because now she is a rock climber, a mountain biker, a skier, because she keeps her body strong so that she can safely um, be active and have those kinds of activities that she can do. Yes, we shy away from such high impact things. Um, she swims a lot and um, you know, she's not going down the double blacks with daddy. She's you know, staying on the cruisy blues and you know, taking care of her body. But at the same time, her quality of life and her mindset, I believe, is very different than it would have been if we were still looking at this as a possible muscular dystrophy type or something along those lines. Thank you so much, Michaela, for, for sharing. And I think the stories just, just show how, how two very, very different types that share part of a similar name, the Ehlers Danlos part, and the difference being vascular at the end or hypermobile 
um, type can be so, so vastly different in their presentation and treatment plans and things like that. So thank you again for sharing, sharing your story as well. And thank, thank you and Daphne both for being part of the um, family voice into that Eller Stanlos algorithm um, that now these clinics um, have in their hands. And I sent them two copies so they can pass one along to a to a friend and of course we have it on our website. So thank you, thank you so much. We do have some questions. So I, if it's okay, we'll switch gears into question mode um, and let you all, um, I have one for Michaela to start off. Um, this question is what type of family community support um, do you have or did you have? And did your um, family think there was a problem? Yeah, so, you know, um, I think that it was pretty mixed on whether or not um, in the in the beginning, if there was a problem per se, it was obvious that she was delayed um, in meeting some of those milestones. But in the search for a diagnosis, you know, multiple things just kept happening, like the metabolic crash. And so people knew um, in our family that something wasn't right. But I will say that there was an instance that um, I won't ever forget when she was about a year, no, about two and a half. I think she was about two and a half years old. And her biological grandfather had made a comment to me that she was going to be fine. And everyone has different perspectives on the way we see medicine, the way we see family, the way we see being parents. And in my mind, the way I interpreted that um, surrounding a conversation about her therapies that I was having with um, her grandmother, um, she's going to be fine, negated all of the effort that Lily had put in to get to that point. She was going to be fine. And I knew she was going to be fine, but she was going to be fine because of the amazing medical care she had received because of all the hard work that she put into it. And so sometimes I feel like it's a loaded question of whether or not people, you know, think that there's something going on when you have a kiddo that's medically complex, um, because fine to a, a heart specialist can be different than fine to a PCP in a certain way, you know, and it's, it's, it can become very, very difficult to interpret that and navigate that as a parent. And to answer your second question, community resources for us, the very first one that was really strong was Special Olympics Colorado. They came into Lily's life when she was four and um, she was able to get onto a swim team. So even prior to diagnosis, we were able to connect with other families. I since um, founded a low profit organization called Someone Like You, where we connected families based on symptoms. And then moving forward to that, um, we were able to actually help um, with advocacy. Um, I'm a board member for Colorado Rare, which is a nonprofit here in Colorado that helps represent the half a million Coloradoans who have rare conditions. And so there was some support and then, um, you know, we sought out more and actually created more. So that's been great. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And I'll just direct um, that question to, to Daphne and Katie as well, because I know you all have done some advocacy work and family support work as well. Do you want to share a little bit about what you've done on the vascular EDS side? <coughs> because, because only five things existed whenever you started on this journey. It's not, that's not true anymore due to some of your efforts. Sure. I'll get started on that one. We, right after he was diagnosed, it, okay. Being at a university, at a rather large university, it's not one of the giant ones, but we have resources and we have faculty members. We've got a, a, all different kinds of resources that we, can, that we can tap into in different ways. So Ryan was diagnosed in November and I realized that there were other people out there who had vascular EDS that had never met anybody else with vascular EDS, which is a big thing um, because you know you have a limited lifespan and you all have a lot of the same events and all that kind of stuff and a lot of things in common, but you've never met one. So we got the resources going to, to work with uh, our university and with Texas Children's and with the nonprofit that Katie and Kyle founded, Ryan's Challenge to actually bring all of the families in Texas together 
to the Sam Houston State University website, I mean, uh, campus. And we spent the weekend together, uh, Friday and Saturday. And we had different people come and talk about um, financial difficulties. Our family, we had a family life um, professor. That's his, his family life support. And he has a special needs daughter. So he had all this kind of things about caregivers and parenting. And then we had a developmental psychologist come in and a physiological vascular, whatever he is, uh, exercise guy, let me just put it that way, who, who works with um, difficult cardiovascular challenges. And we had him, and then we had an attorney come who talked quite a bit about the Americans with Disability Act and, and school. we had a school specialist come and how to get services at school and what to do. And even though we only planned it for, for Texas, we had people come from Utah, um, there's Arkansas. I mean, we had other states. I can't remember who all was there, but not only that, but then we, we found out the vascular docs at Texas Children, who's probably the number one vascular doc for e a vascular EDS in the world, asked to come. And the adult doc, who's probably number one vascular surgeon for vas uh, vascular EDS, asked to come. And then we had Dr. Peter Byers, who's the number one geneticist asked to come. So we had all these, these three experts that asked to come. And so it's kind of like, well, if you're going to come, we're going to let you speak. And it's kind of like, great. Um, and we had never done this before. And I'd like to say this was, we got our students involved. It was a graduate student. It was her internship. She, she organized everything. We had students, they arranged for food. They got donations from like Subway, and then they had one church bring food, and and we had about 150 people there, which was quite a few people considering how many people have vascular EDS. But if you had it and you were close to Texas, you came, and it was amazing. Um, lifelong friends because of it. It it was amazing, and that was really the beginning of the the community starting to get together to look at resources and to pool resources to start doing some type of research. And from that, one of the things that, what, that we did then was apply for a grant for finding out what the people with vascular EDS wanted researched. And one of the first things they wanted researched was a health-related quality of life study. I can do that. that that's an easy thing for for me to do that goes right down my, I'm a behavioral scientist, that goes right down my field of study, even though I do have a genetics background, that goes right through my field of study. So we've just completed a health related quality of life study for adults. And we will be giving those results at a um, consortium at a conference in Paris in August. The next one we have is a pediatric quality of life study. And then we're planned to do a caregiver, parent, spouse, that type of thing, health-related quality of life study. And we found out that we had to have those type of studies done before we can get funds to research, big dollars to research other types of treatments. And so that, that was an easy thing for, for us to do. And as a grandparent, I got asked yesterday actually by another professor, because we were up at the, at the office late working on the stats for, for that study. He said, why are you doing this? Because I have another research interest. And I said, because this is my grandson. I said, once we have a cure, I'm done. But this is for my grandson. But once we have a cure, I'm done. And he said, okay. That's, so I was just wondering, because I see you working on this so much. And it's kind of like, there are all kinds of rare diseases out there that aren't getting the the press they need and because people don't know about it but there are families out there suffering but thanks we've, for, oh, we've thanks, for, yeah. thanks for sharing that Daphne yeah I, I know how passionate you are as a, as a grandma and I know um Katie and and your husband your your outreach with your with your nonprofit has probably just been so life-changing not only for your own family but for other families that you've touched with that Michaela you had another comment I see Yes, I just wanted to add that I found um, 
I found during the search for what was going on with Lily, some sometimes um, toward like the end of it when um, I think, forgive me, it's hard to remember all the details, but I think it was kind of right when we were waiting to get in to see the connective tissue doctor, um, geneticist, that hypermobility was, uh, EDS was starting to become a conversation we were having. And some physicians would say, it can't just be hypermobility. And um, what was very interesting about that is then um, a few years after Lily received her diagnosis, we had the Ehlers-Danlos Conference at Children's Hospital and we brought together many physicians at our hospital, but then also from across the country, they came in. And that's when they learned, you know, when you can't connect the issues, think connective tissue, it can be a form of hypermobility can affect so many different areas in the body. And I think that, um, I think that that's something that more physicians are starting to think about and it, it can be on such a scale. Uh, Lily received, um, ehlers danlos according to the geneticist, geneticist from me. I didn't know it wasn't normal to dislocate your ribs, um, your whole life. I had dealt with those things, but it was very localized. And, um, I also have uh, my derived prolapse with regurgitation, some other things that can kind of relate to that. So I just think that um, even though there are so many people that struggle and we're learning so much more, I love seeing videos like this and family conferences like this because I feel like the more that we can speak out and talk about our experiences, the more people are going to think, um, physicians are going to be able to think about these things. So thank you, Chris. Thanks for those comments. Yeah. So I'm looking, we just have a, just a couple minutes left. So I just want to give the, um, each of you, including Katie, the floor. So just a quick one minute. Um, uh, what advice would you give to another parent who's just been, just been recently diagnosed? So this is a quick, quick round, not, not, not too long uh, since we're just having up the top of the top of the hour. So Katie, do you want to start us off? What advice you would, you would give another parent who's just received a diagnosis for their child? That's a loaded question. Um, it really is because there's a lot. Um, I would just probably say it's okay to go through the grieving process because a lot of people don't um, understand that a lot goes through your mind. And seeing my husband and I literally take the diagnosis completely different ways. One, because he was in denial. Two, I knew something was wrong. But it's okay to grieve. Like, it is. And that would probably be my biggest advice is you're going to go through the grieving process, all seven steps, whether it goes fast or whether it goes slow, but it is okay to go through the grieving process. Great advice. And not just for vascular EDS, right? For, for probably any diagnosis that you Correct. receive for your child. So yep. great, great answer. Um, Daphne, do you want to say what, what advice you would give maybe to another grandparent <laughs> that maybe just received a diagnosis? Your kids, your, grandchild. your kids need your support and you need to be their advocate. If you support them and listen and you're their advocate, whatever they decide, I will back them up 100%. Uh, they need your support. Even if you don't think it, anything's wrong, keep your mouth shut and back them up 100% because they have to have strength to advocate for their child. And if they don't have support, they're not going to have that strength to be their child's advocate. Great advice. How about you, Michaela? Just lean in, lean into your doctors, lean into your family, lean into your friends and know that, that whatever you're feeling is okay. What great words of wisdom to wrap us up today. I cannot thank you all enough for your time and um, preparation for this and information that you've shared with our um, Time for Genetics clinics. The fact that we're recording this, um, I hope that it will live on and be able to help a lot of um, primary care physicians and families down the road. So thank you for your time today and have a great rest of your rest of your week. Bye bye, everyone.